Hi, I'm Dixie and I make historical clothes. And in my last video, I talked about the best beginner-friendly historical corset patterns. And for that video, I realized I didn't have great photos of some of my corsets. So I decided to shoot some footage to use in that video. And while doing that, I thought, well, maybe I should just get shots of all of my corsets. So that turned into a full day of putting on every single corset I've ever made. And I think that's as good an excuse as any to share with you my entire historical corset collection. And I'm going to do this in order of when each were made because my skill level greatly improved over time and I want you to see that. Your first version of anything isn't going to be perfect or even necessarily good. Sometimes we need to temper our expectations in the beginning and just enjoy the process of learning, right? The first historical corset I've ever made was a kind of generic Victorian corset using Laughing Moon 101 and a kit I bought online. And I'm not even sure I'd recommend buying a kit to make a corset because it wasn't really that great of a value and I ended up having to alter a bunch of the pre-cut boning anyway. When I first made it, I thought it was great, but now I realize there are several fit issues. The biggest being there is not nearly enough room in the high hip area, so the whole corset rides up, turning what ought to be a mid-bust corset into an over-bust corset. The waistline of the corset now sits at about my lowest rib, which means that my actual waistline is larger than it needs to be. I also cut the bust gussets way too big at first and had to jerry-rig them to be smaller after most of the corset had been assembled. This corset is made with a plain white coutille fabric and the black ribbon trim isn't functional. That detail and the lace on top were added for a cosplay I did years ago and I just never bothered taking it off. I actually no longer have this set of stays, so I only have these small photos of them, but I do just want to talk about them briefly. I think a lot of new costumers think that short stays are somehow going to be easier than long stays to make, and that's not necessarily the case. But more important than that, I felt like these had a major flaw in that because they were so short, the chemise underneath would poof out right at the waist area, and that ballooned my dress out in an awkward way. So I took these apart to salvage the bones and ditched the remains and instead made a pair of long corded stays. These are also made with a laughing moon pattern. They use a paint stir stick for the center busk and are mostly structured with rows of cording and just a few bones. Looking at these stays, you wouldn't think they needed that much cording and I don't even remember how much I used, but I do know that I did not buy enough. And I had to keep going back to the craft store so many times to buy more cording that the lady at the checkout counter literally told me, more string? I hope you're not tying up your sister with all that. I think the fit is pretty good on these, except again, there probably needs to be more room in the hips. You can see where the fabric rolls at the point of the hip gussets. Still, these stays are quite comfortable, however they are back lacing, so they take forever to get laced into. From there, I decided to tackle the 18th century. These stays were made with a J.P. Ryan pattern, and unfortunately, the shape of these is more cylindrical than the fashionable conical shape at the time. There really is not enough room in the bust, and I just don't like the way these fit or look. I used strips of reed for the boning because it was cheaper than synthetic whalebone, and there are a lot of bones. But I can hear the reed snapping every time I try putting them on. This probably could have been prevented if I put two strips of reed in each boning channel, but of course, I didn't know that at the time that I made it. And I still have my giant roll of reed in my sewing closet years after making these stays. Oh, and these are again back lacing and a beast to put on. It was at this point I decided never to make any corset back lacing only ever again. For my next corset, I went all out for a fancy Edwardian S-Bend style. It's made with coutille faced with silk taffeta and made using a truly Victorian pattern and it is one of my favorites. I didn't make any changes to the fit, however it is meant to be worn with padding. 
Here I'm just wearing it with a hip pad. I also have bust pads to go with it, but I think the bust pads make the bust look funny when it's just the corset on its own like this, so I left them out. It all looks fine when it's covered with a corset cover and a dress, though. This was the first corset where I really felt satisfied with the shape and the fit and felt proud of my work. You know, five corsets in. So for my next corset, I decided to take everything I'd learned and return to my first corset pattern and try again. You've seen me make this one in a video from a couple years ago. I used that same Laughing Moon pattern and adjusted the fit for way more room in the hips. Although I wish I'd altered the bust shape more to be curvier as well as it does kind of get a little squished. I think that's a common problem for us small busted folk. I wanted to make a super fancy Victorian corset, so I used some scrap black taffeta and flossed the ends of the boning channels. Flossing was both decorative and functional and helped keep the bones from shifting around inside their channels. The boning pattern was modeled after some extant designs. I was looking for an 1880s-ish look, but alas, I don't have any 1880s costumes I can wear right now. I probably ought to remedy that. For my next project, I decided I really need a better option for the 18th century, so I made the 1780s red threaded stays. These are a vast improvement over my first set of 18th century stays. They're made with scrap silk shantung and bound with leather. Although if I were to do it again, I'd probably get a different kind of leather as this stuff is a little thick. These are half bone stays made with synthetic whalebone and are front lacing over a stomacher, which is so much better than back lacing stays. The only problem with the fit of these, and this is something I couldn't have really known until I wore them for a longer period of time, but there are these angled bones in the center back that end right where the curve of my spine starts moving outward, and that's not too comfy. It's not a huge deal, and I suppose I could always just shorten the bones or move the channels, but I haven't bothered because I rarely wear these for more than an hour or two at a time. I also do wonder if they even need the straps, Probably not, but I still like having them anyway, even if it just helps keep my shift neckline in place. This next corset is one of my simplest and probably my favorite to wear. It's the 19 teens Rilla corset by Scroop. It's lightly boned and the long line over the hips keeps everything snug and smooth. It's my only corset with garter straps, which takes some getting used to if uh, you've never worn anything like that. And it doesn't offer much bust support at all, but luckily I can get away with just a well-fitting chemise on top. The print of this ticking fabric makes the corset feel more utilitarian than fancy, which I like. Sometimes it's nice to have a normal everyday corset instead of the super floofy silk versions. It's the most comfortable of all of my corsets just to lounge around in, and of course it has a split busk, so it's easy to get in and out of. I tackled the Regency period again next, since my corded stays take so long to get into. This transitional Regency style corset was based on an experiment from research by a European blogger. I had to draft the thing myself and used a couple layers of lightweight cotton twill. The best thing about this corset is that it has no lacing at all. These long straps crisscross in the back, then wrap and tie in the front. It is so easy and I love it. A couple things I've noticed since I've worn these, and I wear them for almost all my Regency era costumes now because they're super easy to put on. Usually when I first put them on, I do an initial tie, then I wander around for a few minutes and do whatever else I need to get done, like gathering my clothes and accessories or doing my hair. Then I readjust and retie the stays because the first tie will always be too loose by that point, and this thing needs to be very snug or else it won't hold anything up. And I know a lot of you are wondering if you can see a bump from the bow in front through the gowns, and actually, no, I haven't had that problem. Probably because one, it's hidden under a petticoat, and two, Regency gowns aren't close fitted to your waist, they just kind of float away from it so the bow stays hidden. Now, if you have a smaller bust to waist ratio than me, that might be an issue, so keep that in mind if you make them yourself. For my most recent corset, I wanted a shape that would work for the early Victorian period, and I wanted a less fancy option than my black 1880s corset. 
I used a black snail pattern and the same twill as with my lazy corset, but I tea dyed it beige or drab, which was a very popular color at the time. It's kind of like the Victorian equivalent of nude. This shape is somewhere in between that of the slim Regency and the super curvy shape of the later Victorian period with a longer waistline and a slightly high bust line. It's lightly boned and I did tweak the fit a lot. It's also my only true overbust corset. All of the others, with the exception of the 19 teens ones, hit right at mid bust. Sadly, though, this one is already verging on too big. I could alter it, but that would mean taking most of it apart, and I don't really feel like doing that right now. So, that is my entire corset collection spanning about 160 ish years. Some of these I doubt I will wear again, but I'm still keeping them for posterity. Others get worn all the time. I'm pretty much set for corsets for most eras. However, if I wanted to fill in some gaps, I'd probably make a set of 1830s stays and try the fan lacing style. 1830s stays are like an evolved version of the long Regency stays, but are usually a bit curvier. I'd also like to make a good pair of fully boned mid 18th century stays. My red threaded stays work well for the late 18th century, but the mid-century stays are slightly longer in the waist and have a more upright shape in front. I didn't bother measuring myself in any of these corsets, mainly because I don't reduce or tight lace or anything like that, so all my waist measurements are pretty much the same, about 28 inches. Bust and hip measurements vary based on the shape of the design. But the point of corsets is to create a frame for the rest of the outfit to sit on. I really like making corsets. They're a challenge unlike any other kind of historical sewing and the shapes change drastically over time. So there's always a new technique or design to try out. Thank you for watching and please subscribe for more videos like this. And if you have made a corset before, please tell me your favorite patterns in the comments. Until next time, happy sewing.